When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like for everyone to know that the attendant did not strap him in. Here is the captain. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited, thrilled even, to be featuring Sneaky Effin Vanilla, bourbon barrel-aged imperial stout with Madagascar Vanilla by the hardworking crew over at Arcane Ale Works. We are going to drop a four and a quarter bottle cap rating on this one, and let's give some cheers and thanks to our good friends that helped us out with this week's beer fun. First up, let's do a big, big cheers and thanks for listening to Morgan Wallet and Prosper, Texas. Cheers to you, Morgan. And a big shout out to Justin in Alpharetta, Georgia. Next, we have a cheers to Carmel in Daytona Beach, Florida. And a big We Like Your Jib to Catherine in Groton, Massachusetts. And here's a double cheers to our friends up north to Sally and Moosey in Canada. And last but certainly not least, we have Megan in North Chicago. So a big thank you goes out to everyone who has contributed to the True Crime Garage Beer Fund. Yeah, B W E W R U N Beer Run. And if you're on the mailing list, make sure you check your inbox. There will be a promo code to the store. And if you're not on the mailing list, get on the mailing list. And that is enough of the beers, Nias. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Most crimes are solved fairly quickly. This includes the worst and most heartbreaking of crimes, murder. Law enforcement use information collected at the crime scene and eyewitnesses to lead them to the perpetrator or perpetrators of the crimes they are investigating. And then an arrest is made. After that, it's left to the courts and often a jury of one's peers to sort it out. And it's another bad guy or killer off the streets. But then... There are those crime scenes that yield little in the way of clues. And after talking with persons in the area, you discover they too are able to provide only a tiny amount of helpful and useful information. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, law enforcement rely on their greatest of allies, the general public. Because the public together is powerful 
and generally despises criminals, especially the violent ones, as much as the women and men with badges working so hard to track them down. And that is what we have on tap here in the garage this week. It's a unique crime of the worst kind. A killer with a brief interaction with the victim, and then just seconds later, he vanishes, leaving police with little to work with. One of the first articles regarding this murder is from the Detroit Free Press, from November 13, 2013, and reads, Taylor, Michigan. Clerk at Cash Advance Store killed. Police are investigating the fatal shooting of a 30-year-old female clerk at an Advanced America Cash Advance Store. 8229 Telegraph. One question facing detectives is whether Chelsea Ann Small, a mother of two from Gibraltar, knew her attacker. An alarm was pressed just before noon Tuesday, police say. Officers found Small dead. The killer had fled. Security tapes show a male suspect. Call 1-800-SPEAK-UP if you have information. But garage regulars will know that we have a much larger story to tell. Join us as we tell this horrific true crime story and ask the public's help to track down a killer. This is True Crime Garage. Before we get earballs deep into this week's case, I think it is most fitting to paint a picture of the area of where this horrific crime took place. This week's unsolved homicide does not belong in any town or city, but it's incredibly out of character for where it did take place. So today we are going to go to Taylor, Michigan, which is located in Wayne County, Michigan, and Taylor is southwest of Detroit. The population is a little more than 60,000 good, hardworking people. The crime rate in Taylor is not what I would call particularly high for a city of that size, but we should note in the last 20 years on a scale of 1 to 100, the U.S. violent crime rate is 22.7, and Taylor, Michigan's violent crime rate comes in at 27.1, so a little above the national average. But 60,000 people is a considerable population, and due to the city's location, it's near Detroit, and the other nearby cities are pretty well populated too, Taylor sees its fair share of traffic and passers through. Now, I've never been to Taylor, only drove through myself, but from what I can tell, this is your typical nice Michigan city. Taylor is named for Zachary Taylor, a one-time national hero, and our 12th president. In Taylor, we have a well-traveled road where the unsolved homicide that we are discussing this week, this is where this went down. This is on Telegraph Road. Telegraph is part of U.S. Highway 24. The highway runs through three counties in southeastern Michigan. This is Monroe, Wayne, and Oakland counties. So obviously, this is a well-traveled road. This is Telegraph Road. Now, back in 2013 on Telegraph Road, we have the Advance America Check Cashing Store. This is one of those high interest rate loan joints. Every city has one. In larger cities, you'll certainly see several of these types of businesses. Advance America specializes in lines of credit. Payday loans, which is a short-term loan typically paid, typically due on your next payday. Installment loans and title loans where you get money by offering up the title to your vehicle, but you still get to drive your vehicle as you pay that back. And I don't know about today, but back in 2013, some of these locations offered tax services as well. I'm unsure, Captain, of the business hours eight years ago, but I wouldn't imagine that the business hours would vary too much from the current hours, which are as follows. Closed on Sunday. Important, especially in this case. Now, we are going to take you back to Tuesday, November 12th, 2013. 
We have 30-year-old Chelsea Small. She is working solo at the Advance America located at 8229 Telegraph Road in Taylor. The business opened up at 10 a.m. that day, so I would imagine this means she is arriving shortly before 10 a.m., depending on the opening duties. Chelsea is working in a manager capacity, which would be expected if she is opening and operating the business by herself, which is the case on this day. According to Chelsea's mother, Debbie Kamen, around 10.30 a.m., the two of them talked briefly on the phone. Debbie says Chelsea told her that she had just finished up some of her early morning tasks and really everything sounded like business as usual. Chelsea's only complaint was that it seemed like they were dumping a lot of work on her at this current time. We all experience this at work, right? Just another day, especially middle of the week when you just want to get all of your work done, get the work day over with and go home. So this is very likely the way that Chelsea felt on this Tuesday. So everything was plain and simple normal. This is until 12.04 p.m. So this is lunch hour on a very busy road. A man knocks on the door of the Advance America. Now, We say knocks, we don't know for certain, but in the dramatization that they show, the man knocked or tapped on the door. But what we do know for certain is that there would be some type of notification that the man wanted to enter the business, be it simply visual or otherwise, because the store front is glass, including the front door, but the door is always locked. It's typical for these businesses to always be locked, even during business hours. And you even see this at some banks and jewelry stores and such. So think of a jewelry store or bank where you have to be buzzed in. This is the same thing. You can't enter until a staff member hits the button, which unlocked the door, and then you are free to proceed inside. Now, some robberies are obvious, right? You see a mask. You see a weapon or someone you know to be bad news and you don't hit the button. You don't unlock the door. Some robberies are obvious. This one was not. What Chelsea would have seen when looking at the man standing at the door, waiting to be buzzed in, is a pretty average-looking, stocky, middle-aged man. She buzzes him in. He opens the door and walks inside. Now, the layout of the business is very basic. You have the storefront where the customers enter Then there is probably about eight feet deep, maybe a little more. But all the way across the entire width of the store, this is standing room only. Space where lines can form. This standing space leads up to counters where staff can assist the clients. The counter goes all the way across. So picture a line that goes from one wall all the way to the other. This completely separates the staff from the customers on the other side. There is a little door in the middle of the counter and the counter is like chest high and the little door looks to be just slightly shorter than the counter. Now Chelsea is sitting at the counter space furthest to the left of the man. So he walks in and approaches Chelsea at this counter space to the left. It looks to me like she starts to get up And this could be for any number of reasons, simply just to greet the customer, or she could have noticed something because this man has a gun. Now, the gun is not obvious to me before he is standing right in front of her. In fact, he brought with him a dark bag. So I have seen and heard this bag described two different ways. One, like a banker type bag. This could be with a zipper or some of them even have maybe a lock, but the way that it's most commonly described and described by detectives as well is that the bag is more like one of those flimsy drawstring type bags. And again, I've seen and watched the security camera footage repeatedly, and it absolutely looks like a cheap drawstring bag to me. And I got to tell you, Captain, it looks way too much like a drawstring type bag that I'm awfully shocked that there's even that bank bag description. I think that that just kind of muddies the waters a bit. Let's go a little more in depth of what we see. We have a white male wearing a black baseball cap, dark blue. I can't tell if it's a shirt or if it's a jacket, but it looks like it's 
either tucked into his uh, pants or maybe it's a elastic waist if it's a jacket. Uh, he's wearing black pants and it looks like um, they look like tennis shoes to me, but I can't tell if they're just like dirty white tennis shoes or if they're supposed to be like tan. They're described by law enforcement as light colored boots or shoes. And then also you notice on the baseball cap, there's a little white marking on one side. So there's an emblem on the front of the ball cap and an emblem on one side of the cap. And there's also some kind of white tag or some kind of white emblem somewhere on his pants. It mm-hmm. might be, it's near the belt area. Uh, if for those that have not seen pictures of this perpetrator, but from what I can tell the perp arrived at the advance America store with the bag. Mm -hmm. So then he will take this with him when he leaves. So other than what can be seen on the security footage, of course, no one knows for certain exactly what kind of bag it is. We can only look at it from the footage and describe it. It's dark in color. And if I had to guess, it's, black but again we can't say for sure and i would agree with you most of the pictures that you see of this bag i would agree with you it looks like a cheap drawstring type bag but there is one image where it looks like maybe there's a zipper across the whole top or maybe it's an envelope or something sticking out there's one picture that maybe looks more like a bank bag. Yeah, it definitely appears to open on the top or on one side. Okay, so the man walks in and goes to the counter at the far left. Chelsea is sitting and appears to start to stand up either to greet him or because she is alarmed by seeing the gun. My guess, Captain, is that the gun was in this bag as he gets to the counter and then he pulls the gun from the bag and he immediately shoots Chelsea Small. Shoots her once. He then appears to place the bag on the counter and then he walks. And I want to strongly emphasize this for those who have not seen this footage. He walks. He does not run. In fact, he walks very calmly to his right to that little door, the door that separates the counters. He reaches over the door. Again, the door is just a little shorter than the counters to the left. And he hits some kind of latch or lever on the staff side of the door. This frees the door for him to push it open. And he walks still very calmly behind the counter to the left up to the victim Mm -hmm. and then fires the gun again. He then can be seen looking around like on some of the counters behind the counters. And then he walks towards the back wall still in the same room appears to check some kind of cabinet and calmly walks back to the front of the store. Now he's in the customer area again. And then I believe he puts the gun back inside of this bag. I can't tell for certain, but the gun goes away. And then he walks out of the store. When officers arrive on the scene, they arrive within minutes, and they find Chelsea Small dead behind the counter. Now, a few things happen during the course of these events, and we'll go through each item after I list them here. One, the killer did make off with some money. Two, Chelsea activated the silent alarm. This is how law enforcement knew to arrive on the scene, indicating that a robbery was in progress. Mm -hmm. And three, at some point during this whole situation, the killer's gun jammed or malfunctioned at some point. So the killer entered the Advance America store at 12.04 p.m. This is a very specific time, and detectives would know this, obviously based off of the security camera footage, but likely from the electronic magnet door lock as well. Now, the building I worked in years ago, it would make an electronic record every time the door was unlocked and opened. So while he would need to be buzzed in, one could simply trigger the infrared proximity sensor and click the door unlocks so he could leave the store. He needs to be buzzed in, but does not need to be buzzed out. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get into those three pieces of information, captain, I want to talk about the timing of all of this along with the door to the business. So we know thanks to the security measures and technology that the perpetrator entered at 12 4 PM. 
This, again, is the lunch hour on a very busy road. And then as far as we're being told, nobody sees a thing. What we are being told is simply that the security camera is our only eyewitness. So the timing seems weird, but notice when we went through the business hours. Mm -hmm. On Tuesdays, Advance America is open only from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So it's the shortest hours of operation for the entire week. Remind me, where are they open on Mondays? The business is closed on Sunday. Open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Tuesday. And 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturdays. So maybe the perpetrator knows that there could be less customers on Tuesday. Or possibly he knows that there's less employees on Tuesday because of the shorter schedule. Right. And so where my head goes is... I believe this tells us one of two things, possibly both for the business itself. Either the structure of this day is significant to the business due to some kind of operational procedure required by the business. Right. Or, and maybe it's an and or, this is most often the day when the business receives the least amount of traffic, the least amount of opportunity to generate more business. Less traffic means less staff. So you got to wonder... Is this kind of random? Did he just pick this day at random because it was good for his schedule? Or did he want to do this on this day because of the limited hours, right? So did the killer know this? And was this his choice of hitting the business on a Tuesday part of some kind of bigger plan? Right. If I'm robbing the place or targeting someone that works there, well, this is a good day for me to carry this out as I should in most likelihood, encounter less tellers or staff, also less customers, less people in the parking lot. But then my other question, though, too, is if this is the day that the business is going to see the least amount of customers, is it possible this is the day that they carry the least amount of cash with inside the building? That's a good question. And again, I I also point out the possibility that it has something to do with the 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 behind-the-scenes operation of the business. Right. And that might just be the case. We don't know for certain. But regardless, these are hours that are posted that people could easily find. Mm -hmm. I personally believe that it's, it's not so random that he picked this day and it happens to be their shortest day. I kind of feel like we're working with a sophisticated criminal, someone that takes a lot of time and planning goes into crimes as well as a man that a criminal that's patient. I agree because like you said, when he come, when he gets into the building, he shoots her right away. It's almost like he, he had a plan and he, he really stuck to his plan. And that's what's so damn tricky about this case, because you go, all right, well, he shoots her right away. So was he was he there just to commit the murder and then take some cash to make it a little confusing? Right. To appear as the motive being robbery and not murder. Or did he decide in advance, you know, I'm making this robbery. I'm not leaving any witnesses. Right. Well, or did he did he somehow figure out that she hit the panic button that she triggered the silent alarm. So I spoke with one of the detectives that's worked this case and he told me it was in fact, you know, a a very traditional silent alarm. The, the robber would not have heard anything. It's not a, you know, like most people's home security systems. There's a loud siren that's going off. This would have been a button that she would have pushed that, that he may have seen her push it. He may not have, we can't tell, from the security footage. I'm on this idea right now of the parking lot, Captain, because if he did choose this day, I think he chose this day for the purpose of there being less staff there, probably number one, Mm -hmm. good chance of less customers, less people in the parking lot. You don't want people seeing you in and out of this business on this day. So speaking of the parking lot, we've already mentioned that this is a major road. There are a lot of businesses, obviously, on this street. In 2013, the Advance America was located at 8229 Telegraph. Now, it's no longer there. There is a tax place there now, I believe. From my understanding is that once this homicide took place, 
I'm not certain that the business ever opened back up, or if they did, people stopped going there. Mm -hmm. There's a tax there, a tax place there now. So this was on the east side of the street in a shared building. There's room for four businesses in this building with their own storefronts. So you would have the addresses of 8225, 8229, 8233, and 8237. 8229 is Advance America. It's the second from the left when you're facing the building. There were two other businesses in operation at that time. So I imagine the parking lot in 2013 would have been configured about the same as it is today. And it looks to be that there are just six parking spaces in front of the businesses. That's a total of six, not six each. Mm -hmm. The building is bookended by additional parking. The problem with our case is we don't have any witnesses to the crime other than this single security camera inside the Advance America. We don't have security footage from outside Advance, which could provide some answers, right? Like, Well, I'm guessing the other workers in the other building never even heard gunshots. You'd love to know what kind of vehicle this guy was driving. Yeah. You know, make, model, year, maybe even a plate number. You'd, you'd love to know where this guy parked. Because here's the other troubling thing. We don't have any eyewitnesses saying they saw this guy outside of the Advance America. We don't have anybody telling us what kind of vehicle he was driving, where he came from, and of course, where did he go? Makes you wonder if somebody dropped him off. And I mean, this is such a quick attack, quick plan executed that did somebody drop him off, circle back around and pick him up and head out of town? Wonder if he didn't park there or didn't get dropped off. And I'm basing that off of the fact that we don't have anybody telling us that they saw him coming or going from the store. Mm -hmm. And this is bizarre because it really reminds me a lot of the I-70 killer case where we had a suspect description and a gun description, but out of all of those attacks, no one seemed to know what the guy was driving, where he came from and where he went. Now, one suspicion in that case, in the I-70 case, was that the perpetrator was parking in the neighborhoods that the businesses backed up to. And that could very well be the case here, as that is a possibility if you look it up on the map. There are houses behind the Advance America building. West Point Street runs behind the businesses, and in fact, West Point dead ends twice. So the road stops. It's not complete. So there are houses on West Point. It dead ends. There's like one lot size of space that is grass and then the road starts again and there are some more houses. So someone could park their vehicle along West point road or at either of the dead end spots cut through a yard. Again, there's that space that is just grass. So you don't even really have to, you don't even need to cut through someone's actual property. You walk calmly. No one notices you if you look like you should be there. It's a busy road. Lots of people moving about. You walk calmly to the parking lot, walk past the pizza place up to the door of the Advance America. And earlier we said knocked on the door to notify Chelsea that he wanted in because that's the way it went down in the dramatization. But from the news footage... I looked at the news footage from that November 2013. Now, mind you, the cameras that are trying to film this, this is after crime scene tape is set up and everybody already knows what went down. But the cameras are back by the street. So they're a little distance away, so it's a little hard to tell. But it looks to me, Captain, like there's a button to the left of the door. This is probably a bell or a buzzer that the customers push that triggers some kind of noise notification to the staffer so they can make a quick visual check of the person, unlock the door, and let the customer in, in this case, the man in. Now, your thought goes to, well, then this buzzer or bell would be the one thing for certain that we know the killer touched. So let's try to pull some prints off of this thing. Now, again, I've watched the security footage that was released to the news outlets over and over again. And I am 100% convinced 
that the man is wearing gloves. In fact, I believe he's wearing white or off-white latex gloves. And if so, fingerprints won't be a factor. And the only thing you really see him touch on the camera footage once he's inside is that latch on the back of the door to go behind the counter. On the footage, I believe that I'm seeing a, a much different color. So let's pretend he's not wearing gloves. It would look to me like his, his face color and hand skin color are completely different. And that's what I'm kind of basing that off of, that it looks to me that he could be wearing gloves. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of consumer cellular single line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. We're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers to you, crispy of the crispiest kernels. Cheers, Captain. And I will be posting this surveillance footage on our Instagram, Facebook, and also our website at True Crime Garage. So check it out because I'd be interested to see if people see anything different than we are picking up on. The other thing, too, is think of this week's episodes as more of a commercial, right? It's a commercial asking everyone for their help. Put your eyes on this footage. Let us know what you see. Let the police know if you know something or recognize this man. And the captain every week thanks you for listening. Thanks you for telling a friend. This week we would like to thank you for telling a friend about this case. Not necessarily about our show, but about the Chelsea Small case. Her sister has said, that she believes that the reason why this case has not yet been solved is that the right set of eyes have not seen this case. The local police department, the detectives say that they put the probability rate of solving this case very high. We just need a lot of people to take a break and take a quick look at this footage. Somebody out there will recognize something. Now, the general autopsy information in this case, Captain, is that our victim was shot twice, once in the chest, and then once in the head. The killer did make off with some money. The reports I have seen states that the killer made off with $200 cash. So very simple. The shooter comes in, walks right up to Chelsea. Now there is no audio on the security footage, but it does appear 
that very briefly that there are some words exchanged between the shooter and victim. And at some point, Chelsea activates the silent alarm indicating a robbery in progress. The killer shoots her once, walks around the back of the counter and shoots her again. And then he looks around very quickly. This is interesting to me because he could be looking for more money, obviously, but when he goes to the back, part of me wonders if he's looking to see if there was anyone else in the business, you know, making sure that there's no, yeah, that's a very good point. No other eyewitnesses or, or maybe he's looking for somebody else. He, he makes a move to go to the back, but as calm as he is, he does seem to want to get in rather get in and out rather quickly. But again, could just be looking for money. Their, their business is money. I just don't understand why they only have one employee. I, I almost, I'd almost assume that they would have two employees even on a half day, like on their half day on Tuesdays. And maybe and, just one of them didn't show up that day. And from every report that's out there, the he's only inside of this business, depending on which report you look at, 60 to 70 seconds. 60 to 70 seconds. So everything was happening very fast. And unfortunately... This man was very efficient at whatever it was that he was doing. Now, we said two shots fired, but at some point in the commission of these crimes, the killer's gun jammed or malfunctioned at some point. So this left a live round. This is on the side of the store that is nearest the door. So a silent alarm at that business on a major road is a very high priority call for police. My guess on a Tuesday around noon you're dispatching multiple cars to that scene. When police arrive, the killer is gone. The door is locked. And now given the current situation, there is no one to buzz open the door for the police to come in and take a look around. But that live round, that bullet is on the floor and police see this and that changes everything, right? Because then they very quickly break the glass door. They go in and unfortunately they find this young woman, Chelsea Small, dead on arrival. Well, this case is so frustrating because, like you said, I, I don't know if I see that he's wearing gloves, but we have no fingerprints. As far as what he was setting out to do, did a good job of that. Other than the gun being jammed and possibly this uh, right. shell casing, I don't see what mistake he made. It's, but I can't definitively tell you what the motive was was the motive to kill chelsea and then to get a little money to then confuse cops or make people think that it was just a, a robbery or was it just a simple robbery and she was a innocent bystander dude your feelings are spot on because the detectives that have worked this case there it's a mixed bag between their opinions on the motive of what went down. There are some detectives that say, absolutely, this was a robbery. He didn't want to leave any eyewitnesses. There are other detectives that say, the robbery makes no sense. He walks right in, shoots her. He makes sure that she's dead, too, with the second shot, right? Mm -hmm. And That makes me lean towards the motive being murder. Correct. And he. the other thing, too, is he doesn't attempt to access a safe or some of the detectives. And again, these are just, this is just speculation in people's opinions. We, nobody really truly knows for sure, but some detectives say, look, him looking around seems like he's not really looking for anything in particular or looking for money. And that's why I wonder with the idea when he went to the back, if he was looking for another person to see, to make sure that there was nobody else in that building, because like you said, regular dude, myself included, we would expect there to be more than one person inside that building at that time. So one of the best things that I've heard a detective say in this case, as, f as for what the motive may be, is that if he was simply going in there to rob the place and make sure that he didn't leave any witnesses, this man would be smart enough to know, most people would be smart enough to know, that the best witness, the best eyewitness in this case is the camera. 
not necessarily our victim, unless the victim right. knows this man. So you can take out the human element, the human eyewitness, but he doesn't take out the computer eyewitness. So that's, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a mixed bag amongst the Taylor police department as to what the motive may be. And that carries on to the public as well. Now her family, Chelsea's family seem to think that there has got to be some kind of connection between the killer and their loved one. They say that it could be something as simple as she may have known him, but only knew him through that business. Right. This is a type of business, though. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of paper trail here. I almost feel like if it was somebody that's related to the business, to her, her from work, that they would have been able to come up with something. But therein lies, again, a whole nother set of possible motives that do not have to include robbery, do not have to include tre- Chelsea as the actual target. Well, like you said, it, it could be a customer, and yes, there would be a paper trail, but how many customers are we talking about? You know, at a bank, maybe you see a thousand, some different customers within a month. That that just brings a very large suspect pool. And yes, you can start breaking them down by age, weight, and height. But I don't know. It's a tricky one. And this guy is so common looking. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, he looks like a, somebody that would be out on the delivery or maybe a maintenance worker or maybe some of that works in a garage. You're spot on again. The detectives have all said that it, they believe that he might be wearing some work type clothing, you know, that that is more of a uniform rather than a casual outfit. Yeah, I agree. And the same thing that I said, you know, Chelsea's family has said that they think she probably buzzed him in because maybe she recognized him. And I don't, I'm not trying to take anything away from them. They know this case better than I do, obviously. And, but I, what I see here, captain is what you just said, such an average looking regular Joe, he's got to look like there's got to be a thousand other guys that look like this guy in that area. There's 60,000 people plus living in this area. He looks just like a regular guy that you would, oh, he hits the buzzer. You hear the notification. You look up regular dude at the door, buzz him in. He's just a customer, regular old customer. But like you said, when we were talking about um, uniform, this also looks like a a uniform that maybe a delivery driver would wear, like somebody that was like delivering, like, let's say appliances, or it could be like a semi-truck driver. So like, it still looks like a work uniform to me. Almost head to toe uniform to me. Yeah. Right. Like from, from the hat all the way down to the possible work boots. I can't say 100% certain that those are boots. That's what it appears to me. Other people say they see tennis shoes, but yeah, to me, top to bottom work type outfit. Now, if we're going to go into this and say, well, was Chelsea a target? Is that what was going on here? I think we should briefly discuss victimology. Who was Chelsea small? She grew up in Gibraltar, Michigan. That's pretty close to Taylor. Just about a 20 minute drive. Right maybe about a 28 minute drive north from Gibraltar to the crime scene. But in 2013, Chelsea was 30 years old with two small children. She obviously was working at advance America, but was also attending school at Wayne County community college where she very proudly and appropriately. So to be proud, Chelsea was on the Dean's list. These cases are all sad and heartbreaking, but especially so when we are talking about a mother, a young woman from a close family. I, I want to emphasize that this seems like a very close family to me. She's also a person who was doing all of the right things, working and going to school. And this really, this job is just that it's just a job. This is not a career for her advance America. This was just a stepping stool, something to build her resume, make a decent wage to pay her bills, provide for her kids until she graduated college and would be moving on to bigger and better things. And unfortunately in 70 seconds, that's all gone for what? 200 bucks. Yeah. What's her relationship with her ex? It seems to me, and I only have to base this off of his words 
but he's the father of both of the children. Uh huh. They were never married. And at some point they, they separated, but they, according to him, remained very much a team in regards to taking care of the kids. I wonder if he ever fought for custody. Cause that'd be a motive. He says that he considers Debbie Kamen, who is Chelsea's mother to be like a second mother to him. So I don't know if mm. he stayed close with her family since 2013, but according to him and his name's Rick fairly, according to Rick, they were in the process. He and Chelsea were in the process of, of discussing building their rebuilding their lives together, their family together. Mm -hmm. Now, we were just talking about money, 200 bucks. I want to make sure we are very clear on something before we move on. I've said 200 bucks a couple of times. That is the amount cited in a couple of different sources, news coverage sources. Mm -hmm. I don't have proof of this, but I believe that that is just a generic number. Again, I don't have proof, but I think somewhere along the line, someone said $200 and it's been repeated ever since then. But I believe that the Taylor Police Department's stance on this information has never been an, an exact dollar amount. Their statement has always been a small amount of cash, less than $250. So therein lies really another big piece of this mystery. What was the gunman's motive for going into the store, as you pointed out earlier, Captain? In any of these cases, we've seen this with Yogurt Shop, with the Lane Bryant shooting, La Cruz's bowling alley. I mean, the list just goes on and on. When when the dollar amount, look, no dollar amount is equal to taking lives. But when the dollar amount is so small and the loss of life is so significant, there's it's unbalanced, right? That doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be right or make any sense. And then you go, the, so are we sure the, that the motive was even robbery? Here's my other issue with the way that this um, dickweed looks like. the. We were talking about his outfit, and we go, well, it looks like a, a, a worker's outfit. But it wouldn't be that uh, crazy if I was going to become a hitman. And it was my my first hit. I could see wearing an outfit like this. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. And so, like, even if it was your second or third hit, right? But you know what I mean. Like, it's like it. It's okay, very plain Jane. Let me. There, we're, there's we're, not a lot of identifiers on any of the articles of clothing. Yeah. Unfortunately, we can't make out the emblem on the pants, nor could we on the hat. And. I did say earlier that there's an emblem on the front of the hat and the side. There's 100% an emblem on the side of the hat. Yeah. The the front is a little, we should leave that open-ended, a little in question there, because I don't think I can say 100% that I see an emblem on the front of the hat. Well, again, there's so many pictures, and earlier when we were talking, I kept on going, I don't really see the gloves. Now I cannot not see gloves. So yeah, once you see them there, they seem to be there every time. Well, and it's like, like you said, they're not the, it's not like he's wearing bright, uh, white gloves there. It's almost like there's something just kind of distorting his skin. Like, like maybe it's like clear. I think it's like latex gloves. Yeah. Like clear latex gloves or something. Um, but it just, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, because you go, well, so the, so you're saying that. And I'm not saying it's a hitman, but it's very hitman like when you watch. There's been other people to say that even police have speculated that. And the thing is, he, he walks in, he's in and out and he's again, the clothing. You said the same thing. It would be nondescript clothing and everything's tucked in nice and neat, right? There's not like he's very buttoned up in a way to not to show reveal too much of him or to possibly leave strands of hair. There's very little interaction with the victim herself. There's no indication that he even physically touched her. Right, which is strange because he openly has his hair flowing. Uh, 
underneath his baseball cap. But he's got to look normal enough for her to buzz him in. Well, he has to look normal enough to get into the building. Right. Like, not not just for her to buzz in, but for other people walking by to just Walking not, to and from the building. Right. To not, not raise to, any alarms. But, but what's weird, hearing her mother talk about, well, there were customers that maybe had crushes on her that maybe she wasn't interested in. But you can't rule those guys out. No. Just because this looks like a hit, because some people- there is no emotion, even though people would go, well, well, they killed this person because they weren't receiving their advances, right? But some people are just that cold. Oh, well, she doesn't care about me. Well, I want her dead, but I can do it in such a way where I, I can leave my emotions out of this to make sure I don't get caught because it seems like very cold come into the building, sh- shoot the victim, go look around for some money, shoot her again, take off. Well, think about when we covered the Superbikes case uh, out in South Carolina. Superbike was the name of the business. Someone went in and shot several, of, shot and killed several of the workers. It went unsolved for many years. They eventually solved it. It ended up being Todd Kolhep who committed those crimes. But it went unsolved because they couldn't. They were looking for a connection between one of the victims and the killer, a personal yeah. connection. Yeah, there was no personal connection. There was a business connection, but he didn't care who it was that he killed. He wanted revenge against the business itself. He went in there one day and he thought they were laughing at him and poking fun at him, and he went in there. He waited. Till he didn't think he would encounter anybody else till the place would be empty and almost very hitman like, even though he's acting on his own behalf, goes in there and shoots everybody up. Well, it could be the same thing here where it has nothing to do with Chelsea. It has nothing to do with really the money. It's just, I mean, like you said, people stop coming there. So they shut down the business and could in a way he be an indirect customer Right. Like, let's say because he's we can agree on his age. He He's a middle aged man or appears to be. Could he be somebody that, I don't know, purchased a vehicle for their son or daughter and then they went and took out a loan against the title? You don't pay that loan back. They come and take your car. Could he could he have wanted some kind of revenge that he's not directly a customer, not directly affected by something the business was doing. It it, it all gets a little, it gets very tricky, but I think we're going to start to see some leads here. Now kind of wrapping up on the victimology here a little bit in regards to Chelsea herself. uh, You brought up the, the ex-boyfriend. It's my understanding that since 2013, he has had custody of both of, the children and her mother and her sister. So she has, uh, her parents were separated at some point and her mother remarried. So unfortunately she left behind a sister, mother, stepfather, father, and, um, some stepsisters, but her sister and more so her mother, Debbie came have been the loudest voices to keep this case alive and the most visible of the family to, keep this case alive again the ex-boyfriend rick fairly the father of the children has answered questions and done interviews publicly so he's not hiding or ducking from anyone i've been told by detectives that he was looked at you know you're going to look at anybody that's close to the victim and he was looked at and it sounds like he's not our guy they don't have anything to connect him to the case but One thing that's really tricky, and so there have been three detectives who have been up front and center working this case over the last eight years. That seems like a lot. The case lead has changed due to retirement, but the retired detectives keep a close eye on this case. This is a case that's being worked as a team by the Taylor Detective Bureau. When I asked the current lead, this is Detective Alex Stellini, 
about the case. He said he would put the probability rate of solving this case at very high. So while we're talking about possible motives here, because that's the weirdest part of this case. I mean, let's say Chelsea knew her killer. This guy thought he had some kind of reason to kill her. Well, why do it there? What, right? You would expect anyone with half a brain knows that there's going to be a camera there. Yeah, but if I do it there and I take a little bit of money, I confuse the whole situation. Right. If I if I kill her in her car, even outside the place, and I don't steal her purse or something, then we just know this was about murder and that's it. But again, for me... I understand wanting to kind of confuse the situation, make it look like one crime when really it was all along a whole nother crime. Right. But I don't know that I love the risk of being caught on camera doing anything or the potential of encountering another customer or another staff member. Yeah. But if also, if it was a hit, that's, and I don't know why this mother or two would they'd want somebody would put a hit out on her, but it's better to do it there because you're you're not going to have the kids around. I agree, of course. But again, not wanting people around, we know there's going to be a camera. It just seems to me like you could have found a space, a place, a time where you could have you could have caught her alone and done it then and there and not had to worry about any type of camera at all. Now, one very tricky variable in this case is that if somebody was planning this out, well, Chelsea was covering for another staff member that Tuesday. And some of the reports state that it may have been a little bit of a a last minute, not a very last minute, but a little bit of a last minute change. The most detailed report of this I could find says that it was a few days before the day of the homicide that she signed up for this shift. So what is not in question is she's 100% covering that shift for another team member on that day that she's killed. So this is not Chelsea's regularly scheduled work day. This is out of her routine. The change it sounds like came at Chelsea's request. You know, you trade shifts with someone when you need a day off. Chelsea took a day off to celebrate her son's fifth birthday. This was just a few days prior to the incident. Again, how many people did she tell? How many people would have known that? Then you have to wonder, Captain, does that mean if this person working that day was the intended target of a homicide, was this man who acted so calm and callous so he's every he's every part of the definition of a cold-blooded killer was he targeting somebody else when he walked into the advance america that day all right thanks for joining us here in the garage if you need more true crime garage for your ear balls then check out off the record if you're nasty what is off the record it's true crime garage's bonus show it's every other week we do case updates and sometimes we just talk about silliness or sometimes behind the scenes stuff this week we're doing our crime con 2021 recap that's right that's available on stitcher premium make sure you go and check that out you get a lot of other excellent shows to go along with off the record join us back here in the garage tomorrow until then be good be kind and don't let us
you can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.